What's up folks, if you're new here to the channel, my name is David and I'm here for all of your mandolin related needs. And in this video, I'll be showing you how to play this beautiful waltz, Midnight on the Water. This is a tune that hails all the way from Texas and it's usually attributed to a fiddler by the name of Red Luke or Luke Thomason, which is a pretty awesome name, right? Purple Day. Maybe not. Anyways, his son, Benny Thomason, which is also a great name, he helped bring this tune a lot more notoriety, and there's this great recording of him playing this from the 1960s. I'll drop a link in the description below if you want to check it out. And since then, there's been a lot of great modern interpretations of this tune as well, like this recording from Molly Mason and Jay Unger, or this very mandolin-centric recording from John Reichman, Scott Nygaard, and Sharon Gilchrist. But in this video, I'll show you a version of the melody that I know, and since we're in waltz time and the melody's so sweet and spacious, I think this is a great opportunity to try out some tremolo and double stop ideas to flesh out some of those longer notes. Check it out here. So let me show you how to do this. When you're ready, grab your mandolin and let's get started. Onto the chords here. We're in the key of D and there's basically five different chords we're gonna use throughout this song. So here are the five open chord shapes that I'd start with. And if you're new to playing in waltz time here, check out the time signature for this song. We're in three, four time, which basically means that there's three beats in a measure instead of four, like we're used to for so many other songs that we play on the mandolin. And in this three quarter time, here's a really simple strum pattern to get started with. So here I'm playing down, 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 up, and then that pattern just repeats every measure. Now let's come over to the transcription and see how all this works over the A section. And for this first line, you'll see that we're playing four measures of our D chord to start the tune. Then on the next line, we hang on to this D chord for a couple beats before playing a really quick G chord on the third beat of this first measure. Then we're back to D for another measure. We switch to A for a measure, and then we're back to D for one more measure at the end of this section. Nice, well, let's check out the B section here. And right off the bat, you'll notice that the B section is twice as long as the A, and it also has a bunch of new chords here, right? And to start with, a lot of people play this descending bass line over the first four measures of the B section here. That's what all those weird slash chords are. Whenever you come across this type of chord notation, basically the letter on the left is letting you know what type of chord to play. Play. So here we have D major for all four of these chords here, not too bad. And the letter on the right is just telling you what note to play as the bass note for these chords. So the chord progression here would have a descending bass line of D to C sharp to B to A. And it's kind of a familiar sound, right? Now you don't have to play this, and if you're looking for a way out, you can just hang on to a D major chord for these four measures, no problem. It's gonna sound pretty good, but it's actually pretty easy to play this descending bass line on your G string from the seventh fret on your G, which is that D note, to the sixth fret for your C sharp, to the fourth fret for the B, and then the second fret for your A, and you can just let all those other open strings ring out for some sympathetic sound. But onto the next line here, we have two measures of E minor followed by two measures of B minor. Next up, we'll go to G major for two measures followed by two measures on your D major chord, and then check out this last line here. This is actually the exact same chord progression from the last line of the A section, right? So you've already got this down, no problem. Now, if you're looking for a next step for a chord progression like this, I'd recommend checking out those dreaded chop chord shapes as well. So here are the five shapes that you'll need to chop along with this song. You could also play that descending bass line on the B section, something like this. And again, since we're in three quarter time here, we won't be chopping on beats two and four like we usually do at the Bluegrass Jam. For waltzes, a lot of mandolinists let that first beat ring out on their chord, and then they chop on beats two and three, all down strums, something like this. But I'd say with this really spacious laid back melody here, this approach almost feels a little bit too busy. A slight variation on this pattern is just to chop on the third beat and let the chord sustain on beats one and two. I think this maybe works a little bit better for this tune. So now it's up to you to go back through the chord progression with these chop shapes and try both of these chopping patterns out to see what sounds best to you.
So let's move on to the melody now. And first up, what in the world is this thing in the transcription here, right? Well, that's just letting us know that we're gonna swing the heck out of the eighth notes in this tune. This weird thing in the transcription is specifically telling us that there's a triplet undercurrent to all the eighth notes in the tune. And all the pairs of eighth notes are front loaded like this, where the first note out of the pair gets basically the same rhythmic value of a quarter note within the triplet. And the second eighth note gets the value of an eighth note within the triplet. And instead of having to write all that mess out in the music, we just have this little indicator to let us know how to interpret the rhythm for the entire tune. And for this tune, we'll be alternating pick strokes for every consecutive eighth note. That way we're emphasizing those beats in the measure with those longer down strokes, and then we're catching the shorter up strokes in between those numbered beats. Now, if that sounds like total malarkey, don't worry because it's way easier to hear and feel this rather than see it written out on paper. For example, if we were to play this melody with really straight and even eighth notes, it would sound super stiff and robotic like this. But when we swing the eighth notes like this, it really gives the music life. There's a certain lilt to the rhythm that gives the music a bit more authenticity and earthiness. So keep that in mind as we go through this tune and let's start off with the melody for the A section now. And check this out here at the very beginning of the melody, we have this partial pickup measure with three eighth notes leading into the downbeat of the melody. And since we're starting with this open A string on an upbeat, we're gonna wanna play that with an upstroke to make sure that we're alternating our right hand correctly with the beats in the music. Or in other words, even though this is just a partial measure here, we know that the second note in the pickup falls on a number beat since it's the first eighth note in our pair here. So we'll want to anticipate that second note by playing an upstroke on the previous note to play a downstroke on that beat. It's complicated, right? Well, this actually happens a lot throughout the entire tune. So to make sure that we're alternating correctly, we'll also need to play all these eighth note phrases starting with an upstroke. By the way, I know this right hand idea can be such a maze sometimes. And if you're looking for a more in-depth analysis of pick directions, check out this other video that I made entirely on this one topic. Next, just watch out for all the hammer-ons that we have throughout this tune. In the A section in particular, we're using this one here a lot where we're hammering on from the second fret of the D string to the fourth fret while simultaneously letting that A string ring out. And lastly here for this section, we're playing a slide from the fourth fret to the seventh fret of our D string and feel free to use your middle finger or your ring finger here, whatever feels most comfortable. But that's about it. When you're ready, let's play through this A section together once with the transcription on screen here. So now let's check out that B section. And like I mentioned earlier, this section is twice as long as the A for a total of 16 measures that also repeats. And as you go through this, watch out for a few more eighth note phrases that start on upstrokes like before. Also, we've got a few different hammer-ons, but they're pretty easy. And we also have this slide from the fifth to the seventh fret of the A string with that open E ringing out, but nothing too difficult here. And just like the chords, the melody is actually the same for these last four measures of the B section as they were for the last four measures of the A section. So no problem. So once you got these details, in your fingers, let's give this a try together as well. All right, so you've got the basics down onto the juicy tremolo now and take a listen to this tremolo variation to see what's going on.
So if you're new to tremolo on the mandolin, here's the cliff notes version of what's going on. Tremolo is usually notated by these little hatch marks above each note on the transcription, and basically it's a way of imitating sustain by rapidly repeating notes on the same pitch. Pretty obvious, right? But it's actually pretty difficult to do accurately. So let me show you how this works. And first up, don't worry about that eighth note swing feel that we were talking about earlier. These are actually a lot faster than eighth notes, and we don't really have time to add an eighth note swing in there. We just want to play these as evenly as possible. Next, a good rule of thumb is to always start and end your tremolo on a downstroke. That way you have these really strong bookends at either end of the note. Another thing to keep in mind here is to keep a really relaxed right hand and pick grip so that that pick can glide through the strings at this rapid rate without getting caught in between the pairs. And lastly, I know a lot of people stress that you should only use your wrist when you're playing tremolo, but I think there's examples of some great players out there that do use the forearm when they're playing tremolo. Katarina Lichtenberg, for instance, she has a lot of elbow motion and she's a tremolo master. For me, I tend to do a little bit of both the elbow and and the wrist, so try out some different options and see what works best for you. But before we go on, to make things even more complex, there's actually two different types of tremolo that people tend to use. The first is called unmeasured tremolo, and that's where you're playing a random number of repeated notes at whatever speed that you want to. And then there's measured tremolo. This is where you're playing a very specific number of notes to line up with the tempo and the rhythm of the music. And for this tune and a lot of other waltzes, I prefer to use that measured tremolo because I think it communicates the rhythm of the song a bit better. You know, waltzes, are meant to be danced to, so the rhythm of the song is super important. Now, strap in, because we're gonna get really analytical about this measured tremolo idea. So basically for every quarter note beat that we have tremolo, we'll wanna play two pairs of 16th note triplets to fill in that space. Or another way to think about it is we'll have to squeeze in six notes for every beat that we play this tremolo for. And the handy thing is this means we'll actually be playing downstrokes on all the beats in the measure, so we can emphasize those stronger beats with our stronger downstrokes. So that's what's going on through this entire arrangement here and if you're new to the idea of measured tremolo or you're just having trouble with this concept feel free to throw caution to the wind and just go for the unmeasured approach that's a lot easier when you're first getting started and it's a good way to get your feet wet for this approach too but let's come back to this melody now and for this version i've actually taken a few notes out to better suit this tremolo idea here in the first measure we have a half note of tremolo with this little grace note hammer on from the second fret to the fourth fret but honestly this isn't a real hammer on since you'll be playing all these notes with your right hand tremolo but kind of has the same effect as a hammer on, I guess. Same idea for this slide here. You'll probably be playing all these notes with your right hand, but it still sounds like a slide. Also, because this half note takes up two beats in the measure, we'll actually be playing 12 pick strokes throughout the duration of this tremolo. Plus, we have another eighth note on this exact same pitch directly after the tremolo note, which might be a little bit confusing at first, but Basically, we'll be trembling through the duration of the half note leading straight into this eighth note here, which is kind of the exit note, which we let sustain before moving on with the rest of the melody. So it actually might feel like we're playing 13 notes for this tremolo since there's no pause between the tremolo note and this eighth note, it just kind of flows through. Same idea for this tremolo quarter note. Here we'll be playing six notes for the tremolo since we only play tremolo for one beat, but that tremolo will melt right into this extra eighth note here to get back into the single notes again. So it almost feels like you're playing seven notes for that tremolo. But I've probably thoroughly confused you here, so don't worry about it too much. Just trust your ear, practice this really slowly, and watch out for other areas where you're transitioning from tremolo back to single notes again. So when you're ready, let's give this A section a try. All right, so same story with this B section, but here we're adding in some double stops over those tremolo notes to flesh out the sound even more. And I know tremolo can be a bit more difficult when you're going across two sets of strings like this, but I wouldn't really change anything about my technique. I just keep that right hand really loose and make a wider movement to get both sets of strings in that sweep. But otherwise this B section is all similar, right? So let's give this a go once together.
Well, we've covered a lot of ground here, and I hope this deep dive into tremolo was helpful. If you're a fellow tremolo nerd like myself, your extra credit assignment is to see if you can take this measured tremolo idea and apply it to another waltz that you know. But that's us done for this video. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to check out some of the other videos here on screen if you want to learn even more mandolin tunes. Huge shout out to you, Patreon supporters. Your support has really made this video possible, so thank you very much, and I'll look forward to seeing you all in the next video.